Good morning, church. Okay, how's everyone doing? Good. Okay. Amen. Right. Um, we're going to have fun today. We're gonna, I believe we're going to have fun. I believe that God is going to speak to each and every one of us. As uh, Pastor Tony said, um, we're praying in the upper room and it's, we're just praying for our expectations, praying that our Sunday gatherings is not just a, an activity on our calendar, just something that we feel we have to do. It's off our checklist and then we go about our rest of the week forgetting the experience and the encounters we had today. So we're praying that um, today would be impactful. Be expectant, church. I think um, Elder Bola said that and Pastor Tony said that. Be expectant. Expect that even in the time of prayer or worship, God can touch you. God can heal you. You don't have to um, get someone's hands laid on you to be healed. It, it's, it's, it's scriptural. It's biblical. There's nothing wrong in that. But come with your own expectation. This is not part of my message, but I think Aunt, um, Elder Bola and Pastor Tony really hit on that. And I, I want to share this very quickly. Before, um, this is uh, at least three or four years ago, right? Four years ago, 2015. We'd just come back from the... Uh, we'd come back from Batangas and we were having, so it was, no, 2016, three years ago. And um, before Mother's Day, a couple of young people were going to share on, on that Mother's Day. And I remember in, on the, we would have the early seekers prayer meeting on the Saturdays and we came in and one of the things that I was, um, I was really impressed on by the Holy Spirit and my pastor, also past Kenny as well, and we said that we, we, we need, really need to get onto that, was speaking to the young people about the um, infilling of the Holy Spirit and baptism and speaking in tongues and stuff with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So two of the guys who were going to share that day, I, t I said to them on the Saturday, let's meet after the early seekers and then, you know, we'll you know, explain the whole process and, you know, pray and believe and trust God that you will be impacted or infilled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, in my mind, I wasn't going to do the praying. I didn't think I was, it wasn't, it had to be the, the elders or the pastors because that's, I'm, 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 I couldn't, I didn't think, you know, I could do it. And I honestly can't. Um, so in my mind, honestly, and this is the true situation, I thought, well, I know Elder Rob is going to be at Elder Seekers. So I'm going to ask Elder Rob to speak to these young guys and pray with them. As I came in through the door, Elder Rob is never late. I come in, I look, Elder Rob is not around. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, I look around, who is there? Oh, Pastor Bayer is there. So it, and honestly, I thought that was my second option, and it was only Pastor Bayer. And I'm like, yeah, Pastor Bayer is there, so I'll ask Pastor Bayer, definitely, no problem. As Lord God would have it, that day, Pastor Bayer had, you had to visit someone. So I remember as the, sir, as the prayer finished, I was at the door, and Pastor Bayer was kind of dashing out, and I knew it was not, and I said, oh, Pastor Bayer, and he said, oh, I really need to go out and visit someone, because he had to do the, his pastoral work. And he left through the door, and I was like, really, my God, what am I going to do? Because I'm thinking now, I've told these guys to come. They're expecting something. What am I going to do? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I'm not a respecter of persons. Why don't you do it? I'm like, what? Anyway, long story short, we, start, we spoke to them. We spoke. We, and we started praying. I didn't lay hands on any one of them. And they got infilled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in tongues. The next service that we had for youth, we just put the message out there. And 13 of the young guys said, yeah, you know, we wanted to. And we went through, myself and Chanel, right at the back where the children's room is. We didn't lay hands on any of them. We just explained what it was, prayed. And they all got filled with the Holy Spirit. Why am I saying that? You have to be expectant. You don't have to have a pastor come on, elder lay hands or pour oil on you. I'm not saying it's not good, it's not scriptural. But God can meet you where you are. His hands are much longer than our hands. His reach is far greater than anyone else's reach. So why wait on someone to come and lay hands on you when you have God Almighty with you constantly saying, you know what, I'm right here. And it depends on our hearts and our expectation. If we don't expect to receive nothing, we get nothing. So that's just a, a side product for someone, well, actually for all of us. Let's be expectant. Today, I'm going to speak on a, a title called The Fight is Your Friend. We've been in a series of victory after our fasting and prayer session, and we're carrying on in that, in that, in that vein of, of victory. So today, I want to speak for a few minutes on The Fight is Your Friend. The Fight is Your Friend. We've prayed, we've fasted. What next? We've spoken in tongues. What next? 
we believe God is with us, what next? Because a, a lot of us would agree, we've, uh, we've come out of this period of fasting and prayer, but there's still things that we still haven't received yet. There's still things and expectations that we're hoping for, but we haven't laid hold of yet. It's, it's not ours yet. We haven't, those things haven't become our reality. So what do we do? Do we just keep on praying and do nothing, or is that something that we have to, to do? Does God call us into a partnership to do something? Uh, let's start with a couple of uh, scriptures. Let's go to Genesis 13, and we'll read the three, three verses there. Genesis 13 from verse 12. It says, Abram, or you might know him as Abraham, but Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are. Re remember, where, where, where is Abram at this point? God says to him, look about from where you are. But where is Abraham at this point? If you look, go back to verse, th um, verse 12. Abraham say, the scripture tells us that Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. So Abraham is, oh, is, is living in the land of Canaan. When we go to verse 14, the Lord tells him after Lot has left, look about you. So look about you from his position, Canaan. He's standing in Canaan. God is saying, look about you in Canaan. To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Verse 15. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offsprings forever. Let's fast forward to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to read six verses there. Joshua 1 from verse 1 to 6. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then. You and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them. The NKJV says the land I, have, I gave you, to the, uh, I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Verse 3, I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates, or the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, no one will be able to stand against you all, your, all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous because you will lead this people into, to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Now this is many years after Abraham is gone. God made a promise to Abraham. His Abraham is standing in the land of Canaan. <laughs> and God makes, give you some context to that. Abraham is, has been called out of his actual um, homeland. The, um, he was uh, from all of the Chaldeans. God calls him out, says, I'll take you somewhere and I would give you, I would give you a land. I will, I will make you a father of many nations. I will, I'm calling you out. He obeys. He goes with his nephew. Now, as he, on his travels, he, 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 he grows, he increases. God enlarges his, his territory. He becomes wealthy. His nephew also gets wealthy. Now, these guys are too rich. They've got too many cattle. They've got too many workers around them. They can't, where they are, the land they're in is not big enough to contain them. So argument break, uh, breaks out between Lot's um, um, servants and Abraham's servants. And Abraham is like, look, my nephew, chill. You know, young blood, relax. You're piping up, chill. There's, there's no need to fight. Where do you want? The land is before us, right? Like, take your pick. And Lot looks around like, ah, that land is plain, it's nice, you know, it's, it's not steep. I don't need to go up and down. I'll go for that one. He takes the best. Abraham says, no, nothing. Abraham now is left to the rest. And God tells Abraham, look about you. He's already in the land of Canaan. That land I will give to you and your de descendants. I will make you great. I will make you a great nation. Fast forward now. God makes the same promise. I, uh, Moses is taking the people of Israel out of captivity. He's not quite able to get them into the promised land. Joshua takes over. God tells Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Because that land, the Canaan land, that land, the Canaanite land, I am giving to you. And you will lead the people of Israel into that land and you would inherit that land. One thing, the first thing I want to, to, to encourage you with, God's promises are consistent. He, he, 
he, he says the same thing. He's not one thing today and then another thing tomorrow. You can trust his word. If he tells you this is what he's going to do for you, you can be rest assured that he will not revoke that. His promises are sure. They are consistent. The question is, though, he's not responsible for our potential. God is responsible for his promises. He's not responsible for any of our potentials. He gave Abraham this promise. Moses also heard the promise. Joshua is hearing the same promise. Now, Moses could have accomplished taking Israel into the promised land, but for disobedient. Now, that's not on God. He's, he's, he's saying the same thing. He's consistent. This is over years. Cent, over, over centuries. He's saying the exact same thing. I am giving you this land. I am giving you this land. His message is consistent. His promises are assured. Where we now collaborate with God is our potential. Do we work out our potential? Do we actually do anything with the promises he's given us? We've come out of a period of fasting and praying, and I'm very sure that God has spoken to each and every one of us. He said something to you in that period of fasting and praying. What did he say to you? What have you done with that promise that he's given you? Are you working that promise out or are you waiting for him to speak again? Because guess what? He's going to tell you the exact same thing that he told you already. And now time is passing. For God, time is nothing. For us, however, we've got a finite time. And that's just the truth. We have got a finite time. Time is nothing for God. He lives out of time. He's not bound by time. But we have a finite time. He's giving you a promise. What have we done from the period of fasting and praying, declaring victory? What have we done with that word that he says and that promise that he's given us? Why would God ask or tell Joshua that be strong and courageous? What do you need strength for or courage if you're not going to face a battle? If I'm just meant to chill and relax... I don't need much energy for this. I can sit here all day and actually more than a day without food because I'm not doing much. I'm not exerting much strength. But if I'm going to the gym every day, if I'm going to start doing running with El Bio, then I need to make sure my protein is up because I will faint. My carbs, sorry. You, you see, That's, now you know the way the experience, you, you, you can sell the disparaging experience. Those who know what, to, sorry, Pastor Bayer. If I'm going to go running with Pastor Bayer, I need to get my carbs up. Otherwise, I'll faint. It's just where if I'm exerting energy, then I need something. If I'm not doing much, then it's, it's all good. God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. What do you need strength for? And what do you need courage for if you're not facing a battle? The fight is your friend. The fight is your friend. A lot of times we get scared to go into a battle. We get scared to fight for what God has given us. We get scared to contend for the promise. Thinking, oh, well, if, you know, there's something that we say, and I think it's one of these Christianese or Christian language. Um, if, if God, if he's meant to be, if he's meant to be for me, you've heard, you've heard that one? Yeah. Let's finish. If, if he's meant to be for me, God will make it happen, right? A lot of us have said that. Did it, did it eventually happen? <laughs> well, it didn't. Right? It didn't. Let's keep it real. It did not. Because we've used that. We've, we've used Christian language to, to cover up laziness. And we've used Christian language to cover up procrastination. Because if, we can, if, if the, the enemy doesn't mind you knowing the truth. The enemy does not mind filling you and allowing you to know the word of God. As long as you do nothing with that, he's cool. So I can quote scripture all I want. Ah, this and that. Yes, the Lord is for me. Blah, blah, blah. And then when I go, I'm now going. And he's like, yes, I've got this one. Good. Let him keep fooling himself. Let him keep hyping himself. Because he gets hyped and he's excited. We come to church and, yeah, you know, and then we go about our business tomorrow. And then we're like, oh. that was a nice experience. One of my pet hates, sorry, I know this, I digress a little bit. I, I do not like it when people say, I, you know, the experience. What, what do you mean experience? I'd rather you say the encounter with God. Don't, you, I'm going for the church experience. What do you mean the church experience was good? How about the, you know, I know it's not a big thing, but 
It is actually because the words that we say subconsciously frames our mind. We do not know that the devil is manipulating the things that we say constantly to make us, because the more you say experience, you're looking for a feeling. You're looking for excitement, the lights, the this, the that. So if the church is not popping, like if the smoke is not coming out, if someone is not coming on a string down, if all of those is not happening and if the lights are not flashing and if everyone is, then you feel like God wasn't there. Because you're looking for an experience rather than listening in and like, where is, where is, where is the presence of God? Where is his face? Where am I meeting him? Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is power. He doesn't come without his power. It's, it's not separate from, it's, he's all in. Do you know what I mean? I, I, if I'm going anywhere, I don't go without, I don't know, without my ability to lift 10 kg. <laughs> I know you think I was saying 100 kg, lie. 10 kg, Pastor Bayer, that's the, that's the best I could do. <laughs> do, do. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm who I am everywhere I go, in a sense. And if God's presence is here, obviously his power is here. If his presence is here, his power is here. Let's be expecting that when we encounter him, we leave changed. He gives us, he fills, up, fills us up with inspiration, with energy, with encouragement. Why? For us to just feel good? For us to just feel saved? If that was the end goal alone, then the minute we get saved, we're gone. Rapture. Go to heaven. If he's keeping you on earth, why? If he's constantly encouraging you, why? If he's building you up, why? If he's trying to, if you're praying for wealth, why? Why? The fight is your friend. The fight is my friend. It's uncomfortable to have that conversation with someone, but you know what? It has to be done. So rather than back away from it, it's best that I approach it with humility and love. And let's talk about it before what is little becomes a big issue. And we used to be best friends. Now we can't talk anymore because I refuse to engage in that situation. The fight, church, is your friend. Don't let false humility hide or cover up laziness or procrastination. Victory is, in my mind, is in two ways. Victory is first hearing what God says and then next acting on what he says. That's victory. My brother told me years ago, Yes, my immediate older brother, he told me years ago, he said, Aurora, you know what? Dreams without corresponding action is a nightmare. I didn't quite understand it then. Now I understand what he was saying. He said, Aurora, you can dream all you want. If you don't wake up in the morning and actually do something with what you're dreaming, you would soon become, you soon start having nightmares. Because those dreams that are meant to fill you up, that are meant to encourage you and reinvigorate you and bring pleasure to not just you but those around you begins to haunt you. Because you feel like life is just passing by. Oh, and then you see someone do something that is similar to what I'm like, oh, I wanted to do that. And then before you know it, you become envious. Oh, how come they're doing it? And how come they're prospering? God must love them more than he loves me. No, he loves all of us the same. It doesn't matter where you're a pastor, whether you're a cleaner. It doesn't matter what it is. He loves us all the same. Victory is listening to God, and that we have in the time of fasting and prayer. And obviously, we're still doing that. It's a, it's a, it's a never-ending process. But when he gives you that word, what do you do? He's giving Joshua that word. Now, Joshua, what did, you, what did God tell Joshua? Get up. Get up. Like, stop going around this thing. Moses, you're crying about Moses. Moses, 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 Moses. Get up. It's time for battle. It's time to go to war. It's time to go and fight. You can't just sit down on that promises and expect that the land is just going to go before, it's just going to open up to you. He told Joshua, get up, man. And see what happens when Joshua gets up. This is so, this is so interesting. This is so interesting. In Joshua 5 from verse 13. They've just crossed over the Jordan. And they're just by the um, Jericho. And they're now... From 13, he said, now Joshua was near Jericho. He looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. So he saw a man in a, with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him. He's like, the way I imagine this thing, he's like, Joshua rushed up to the guy with his own sword. Like, what going on for you? Are you for me or are you against me? 
Like, he's, think about it. He didn't know it was an angel. It was only after that he was like, let's, let's read on. He, he rushes up to him. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or our enemies? And then the um, person replies, neither. Verse 14, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell to his face, uh, with, to, to, fell to, with his face downwards in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? God has told him, get up. It's time to fight. Now he's ready to fight. Now he's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to actually go and achieve and accomplish what God has in store for me. The promise he's given me, I'm now going to work out my potential. The fight is your friend. Maybe it's in your education. Maybe you're thinking, oh, I failed this course or I failed that module. Oh, do I give up now? The fight is your friend. When I first started the master's in theology, day two, Second day into the lecture, I called Tokwe. I told Tokwe, I don't know what I'm doing here. Honest to God, right? Tokwe, did I not call you? And after that, I called Pastor Ken saying, I'm going to quit this thing. I've never quit anything in my life, but this one, I was going to quit. Because I sat in the, off, in the, in the lecture um, 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 room, and the professor, PhD holder, all the guys around me all did, you know, theology. First degree, Greek, Hebrew, and all of that. And they're talking stuff, and I'm thinking, these guys are either demons or I'm um, stupid. <laughs> Because they're saying things and I don't understand, like, nothing. And the professor just, he says some theological stuff and says, well, you know what, obviously this is a master's level de degree. This is, you know, level seven. So I'm not going to explain everything to you. I'm not going to baby you. You know, I'm just going to say that and I expect you to get it. And then the one that really did it for me, he said, oh, and actually, whenever you do your assignment, don't ever say the Bible says or God said. I'm like, so what am I doing here then? If the Bible didn't say it, or if God don't say it, then <laughs> what am I doing here? I'm, I'm finished because all I've ever known theology-wise is the Bible said, John said, he said, don't say that. So in my mind, I'm like, Ero, you're done. You're, you're in trouble. I was ready to quit this thing. Like, let me just finish it. But the fight is your friend. I stuck it out. I stuck it out. Now, three years have gone just like that, and it's done. Just like that. The fight is your friend. You failed something. The fight is your friend. Your marriage may not be going well, there might be trouble, there might be issues. What do you do? Do you, do you approach it in love? Do you deal with this situation? Or do you be like, oh, I'm not going to talk about it. Let's sleep in separate rooms. Thinking that is peace. No, the fight is your friend. Addressing the issue is your friend. Dealing with the difficult situation is your friend. The fight is your friend. We cheat ourselves out when we don't get in the fight. With all the encouragement Joshua has, and had received. Moses told him the same thing. Be strong and courageous. The Lord is with you. The people of Israel, although they were very sinful, told him the same thing. Joshua, be strong and courageous. We are with you. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, do it. We will back you up. God himself tells him, be strong and courageous. If he ever needed a word, he got it in plenty supply. Do we need a word? Absolutely. Do we, get, do we have it in plenty supply? Yes, we do. It's in this book. In the time of fasting and praying, we heard it. His promise has already been given to you. Now it's time for us to get up and fight. For whatever you are believing God for, get up and fight. One of the things that we need to do is enlist for service. You have to be in it to win it. If you don't get in the fight, there's nothing for you to win. I can talk about victory all I want. If, if I'm looking for a job, if I don't start applying, there's nothing in it for me. I'm sorry. I, I can confess all I want. You know, God gave the children of Israel manna while they were in the wilderness. When they crossed over, they now ate the produce of the land and manna ceased. Do you, I believe, and God doesn't have any problem supplying us everything that we need on a daily basis. For I, 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 sure, I assure you that at some point you will get fed up of that sort of provision where you have no input. You, you might think you, you would enjoy it, but you get fed up of it, where you have no input, where you do nothing. Because the children of Israel complained that why manna and quail all the time, right? That can we have something else? They want, they want what do they want? Steak. They want, eh? <laughs> oh, 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 what's that fancy stuff? What, um, what's that fancy food? Nando's. Na, eh? Nando's. No. <laughs> Lobster, yeah. Now they want lobster and shrimps. You know, now they're only having whatever this fluffy thing. Leeks and cucumbers. Yeah, there's leeks and cucumbers. Oh, God. Do you, do you know what stressed is spelled backwards? 
stressed, stressed, desserts. <laughs> I know it's a random fact, but just check it out. So if you feel stressed, just have a dessert. No, that didn't go down too well, sorry. No, but the, but the point I'm trying to make is this. You need to get in the fight. You need to enlist for service. The fight is your friend. You can't sit on the sidelines expecting that things will happen. If you need to get into a course, apply for the course. Apply, call the schools. I, I mean, you, I don't know if you remember um, Sam D giving his testimony here and how his parents, you know, called different schools and stuff just to get him into. Imagine if they did nothing. <laughs> we wouldn't be celebrating the boy going through first class and the master's degree. We wouldn't be doing that. It would be like, oh, you know what? What could have been? You need to enlist for service. You need to get in the fight. Paul says it himself that, you know what, it, it, um, he, he, he knew that he could, he could request things from, from the church in, which church is this now? In, Thess, in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thess, Thess, Thessalonians. Let's look at that actually. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 from verse 7. He says, For you yourself know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat any, anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we walked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Was Paul not anointed with the Spirit of God? Yes. Did he not write a lot of the New Testament? He did, but he had to work. He had to get involved. He couldn't just sit down, do nothing, a little sleep, a little slumber. Poverty comes like armed men. You do not work. You do not eat. You need to enlist for service. You need to get in the fight. You can't, you can't just take God's promises and sit on it. Yes, the power of God is, is inherent in his word, but he's calling us to co-labor with him. He's saying, come and partner with me. It's a huge privilege because he really doesn't need us to do anything. But he's saying, you know, I know that for your self-esteem, for your confidence, for just you, just even being. God created the Garden of Eden. And the scripture says that it was good. Yet God tells Adam to tend the garden. What are you tending to if it's already good? What are you doing? Like your garden is already, your grass is level. Like you've actually gone through the entire yard with a scissors and it's all the same inch. There is no blade that is out of sync. What are you tending to? But God calls him to tend to it. God created everything and says, you name these animals. Why is God calling him into co-laboring, into partnership? And it's the same thing he's doing for us. He's saying, come, enlist for service. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. There's no prob the, the harvest is not a problem. The promise is not a problem. What you need is not the problem. Is are we actually fighting for it? That fight could be maybe you going on your knees and just praying. Constantly, daily for what God has told you. Maybe it's healing in your body. Is it one you pray once a month? Or are you every day on your knees saying, God, I receive, I believe. Because you said by your stripes I am healed. And that is your word. I take you at your word. And I am going to trust and I am going to pray and I am going to do all I can. Pastor Tony read the scripture from, from Romans about Abraham. How, you know, despite everything, despite the, the, the deadness of his wife's body, he persevered beyond hope. Now, um, I'm just making sure there are no young children in here. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to say it in a way that he will not understand. Now, let's think about it. God gave Abraham a promise that he'll be the father of many nations. At the time, Sarah hasn't had a child. The promise is he will be a father of many nations. From him and through Sarah, a child will be born. Think about it. What did Abraham and Sarah have to keep doing despite their logic saying this thing is impossible and it is stupid? There is no <laughs> You're backing up the wrong tree. What did he have to keep doing? to get a child. We all, we've all done biology. That's what I'm talking about. They had to go through the reproductive process. No, no, but let's, when you read scripture, let's, uh, I mean, it's right there. It's right there. You understand? It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is, that's not an, uh, 
Jesus. He's right there. What did he have to do? He had to enlist for service. She had to enlist for service. Was it uncomfortable? Probably. Because she's old. And he's old. There were no... Let me come back then. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't back then. So God knows what they did. Maybe there was aloe vera or something. Some natural type product. I don't know. <laughs> no, but, well, yeah, they have good genes. But sometimes, it, it, you know what I mean? It's, it's uncomfortable. I'm just saying. But, but my point is, though, they had to enlist for service. It was uncomfortable. It was painful. But they had to do it. They had to keep going, even though it seemed illogical. Like, what are we doing? Like, this thing hurts. I'm, I'm, I don't even know if I'm enjoying this. But God has given the promise, and it doesn't matter whether I'm enjoying it. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable I am fighting for what he says. Do I need to wake up at 5 in the morning? Yes, I do. It's not just, you know, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, and then we do nothing. And then you become reactive. And God is calling us to be on the front foot. Amen. He's calling us, whether in fashion, whether in media, whether in technology, in whatever industry, to be on the front foot so that we can influence culture. Yes. 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 Why are we praying then? If, if, if that's not what you're thinking of, then why are you praying? What do you need to live? Is it just money? I mean, you, can, you, you, don't, you don't need to serve God. You can just work hard and be wealthy. Yes. Your life will be miserable. Your life would have no purpose. You could do that without God. But if you're doing it for God, if you're saying, I'm doing it because of God, then he's called you to a bigger purpose. There is something he wants you to do. There are people behind you that you are meant to rescue. If you're believing God for wealth, why, does he, why would he give you wealth? Because there are nations that you need to disciple. There are people that you need to bring out of poverty because that is the gospel. God is always about missions. Look through the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's not just about getting us saved. If it's just about getting us saved, the minute we get saved, let's go to heaven. But he's about discipling nations. He says he will bless you and nations will come to salvation because he has blessed you. Enlist for service. Get in the fight. Get in the game. Let's fight. Because if you don't fight, you don't, you don't win. You, you're not in the game, then there's no chance of you getting nothing. You're not trying, then there's, don't play it safe. If we believe God, if I believe God, I'm, I'm, look, this is a challenge for me. And talk about, no, this is, and God has been challenging me yeah, because I, I sometimes, get, I want to do things, but sometimes I, I, I kind of push it out, you know, and yeah, I'll do it later and I'll do it later. And this is, this is really God speaking to me. I'm just sharing with you what God is telling me. So if he hits you well, then great. If it doesn't, then no, yeah, that was just from Iroro. But one of the things that always, I always tell Tope is God had the land of Canaan. God had given them long time from Abraham's time. Yet God says, go and fight for it. For me, that didn't make any sense. Lord, you've already given them. Why don't you just let them scroll into it? He tells them to go and fight an army and nations who already know how to fight. They weren't going to fight slaves. They were going to fight people who had chariots and irons, who were on fortified mountains, who already had walls around the city. These guys have come from slavery, from cooking, you know, naan bread or unleavened bread and, you know, making straw. They've come from that to become soldiers. What discipline, what they had to enlist for service because they weren't soldiers initially. They were slaves. So from slave to becoming soldiers. You need to enlist for service. The next thing you need to do, and this is a big one for us because we use it a lot, and I know for me, is embrace your scars. Embrace your scars. You know, we sometimes have the tendency to hide our scars because we want to paint this picture of perfection. We're always winning. You know, uh, and the truth is we're not always winning. Like, we've already won, but in the process, in fighting, Sometimes we're not always winning. We're not always winning. Joshua 7. They crossed over the Jordan. They're now going to fight a nation, AI. And Joshua sends some scouts to go in and have a look, to spy out, spy out the land. Uh, from two, let's read from 2 till 8. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to AI which is near Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. 
So the men went up and spied <coughs> out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but when they <coughs> but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed only 32 of them, right? They chased the Israelites from, remember, 3,000 went, only 32 gets killed. The Israelites start to retreat. So they chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarry and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted, the hearts of Israelites melted in fear, and they became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the Lord, um, before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. If you read on, it talks about Joshua praying and just uh, asking God what went wrong. They've gone into a battle. They've just experienced a miracle. The Jordan has been parted before them. They go across. They get into a battle. They get defeated. They retreat. Joshua is like, my God, what's, what's, what's going on? Your scars, your defeats, the things that go wrong, that should not make you retreat or never try it again. That should actually take you into more intimacy with God. When things fail, you go back to God, face down, saying, God, what went wrong? What do I need to do? Because sure enough, it's not God's problem. And I know it's not something that we may like, we like to hear in church, but God hasn't got an issue blessing us. God will never lose any battle. So if we do something wrong, maybe because of wrong application or whatever, or lack of understanding, whatever it is, it's not a time for us to feel condemned or feel ashamed. The scars we take to God and say, God, what, what went wrong? Embrace your scars because that equips you. That encourages you, you know, oh, okay, actually, this is where that blade cut. So I know next time not to expose that side. I know now to guard that side. It's an experience. All of these encounters strengthens you for what's ahead. I mean, just think about it. I've, I've got a couple pictures up. Let's, let's put these pictures up of these, of these, of these, of these soldiers. Who, who would you rather go to battle with? Um, would you rather go to battle with this guy on your side? Put the, other, put the other one, the guy on the, with the stallion. Would you, or would, you, would you like this guy fighting next to you? Or would you like our princess to be the one next to you? Who, which, of the, which of these three would you rather have right next to you? Put, put, put the Gerard Butler one up again. Look at this guy. He's got arrows in him. He's got a scar right through almost his eyes. And he's still charging. There's guys laying dead behind him. But he's like, you know, I'm, I'm still going. I'm still going. Who is that guy? Eliezer of Dodo, is it? One of the um, David's strong men that stands in the middle of a field. And he's like, I'm protecting this field. And he's wielding and fighting so much so that the blood becomes glue. And his, the blood sticks to the, 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 uh, the, the sword. And it can't, they had to pry it out of his hand. Would you rather have that guy right next to you? Or would you rather have someone who's never had a scar? Who's never been in battle? who's got no experience, who cannot encourage you when you're down, who cannot pull you up and be like, come on, man, what's wrong with you? Look, look, look at this. And then open it, like, look at this. Come on. Would you not rather follow Jesus who went to the cross? And he says, look, look, look at what I did for you. Look at my feet. Look, look at where they pierced me. All of this is your healing. All of this is your victory. And not, also, not only do we want to fight alongside this guy, we want to be this guy or girl. <laughs> Inclusion. We have to include everybody. Or child. <laughs> Are we going that far? Or oh, baby. <laughs> Actually, let's not forget the dog and the cat as well. <laughs> because some people like their dogs and cats, so we need to include everybody. <laughs> Sorry. But there's nothing wrong in having scars. It's not, it's, not, it's not an issue, thanks, Annalise. It's not a problem if we've got scars. Don't, don't hide your scars. It's not a thing of shame. It's not because, oh, you're, you're rubbish, and oh, that's why you've now got a scar. Oh, God obviously must not love you. No, it's the experience. You've gone through it. Now you know how to do it better. When people come behind you, you know what to do and how to advise them and how to encourage them. You enlist for service. You embrace your scars. 
We're praying, we're praying for, for big things. We're praying for a blessing. We're praying for God to open doors for us. My question is this, please. Why do we need all of this? Is it just for us or is it so that we can be a blessing unto others? Is it so that we can show people and point people to God? Do you want many followers on Instagram because you want to show up something or do you want to really ultimately point something to God? Maybe you're selling a product. Maybe you're selling a service and there's nothing wrong in that. But ultimately, are you still pointing people to God? Or are you pointing people to yourself? Do you want a lot of money because you want to feel comfortable and be able to go on holiday wherever you want to? And there's nothing wrong in that. But is it so that you can be a blessing to others so that people can see God's goodness? Because sometimes people, the scripture says that if someone comes to you and they're cold, don't just pray for them and oh, be warm and then send them on the way. Give them a cloak. <laughs> you, you, need, you need stuff to do that with. The fight is our friend. The fight is your friend. This period of victory that we, we've, we're, we're in, is God is, is breathing on us and saying, look, you, this is yours. But I'm calling you into partnership. I'm calling you to co-labor with me. Get in the fight. Embrace your scars. Bring them to me. Let me heal you and let me equip you and send you back to the battle. Why should you fight? Why should you fight? Why should you fight? And I'll end with this. Joshua 12. I, I love the book of Joshua very much. Like, I think I've probably shared more messages on Joshua than any other scripture. Reason, there's just same places in scripture that just sticks to me. That just, uh, And I hope that you have history as you go through scripture. Same places that this is one of those ones that just stick to me. When, when I got ordained a pastor... We went straight to the Philippines, and the very first message I preached as an ordained pastor was of Joshua. So that's, it's one of the scriptures that's very significant, and I was reading this, and I just kept reading and reading and reading, and I noticed something. Joshua obviously was scared, and I, initially I was like, why is this guy scared? God has told you, but I now started to understand why he was scared, because he's seen a great leader, Moses, in my opinion, one of the best leaders there, there ever will be scripturally and anywhere he's up god tells him you're not entering this promise but this guy is still praying and encouraging the people of israel what a noble guy he is he's not bitter he hasn't departed yet god tells him transfer authority to your next guy he's still alive and he's telling everyone you know what this is the next this is a new guy start to listen to him even though he's still alive it takes it takes something, character, to do that. So I really love Moses. So he's seen Moses do all of this great thing. He's seen Moses bring Israel out of slavery. And he's, in his mind, Moses is taking us to the promised land. Moses is taking us to what our God, Yahweh, has promised us for so long. Moses falls short of it. Of course he's like, my God, he's depressed. I can't do it. If my leader can't do it, the guy who I'm looking up to, who I'm not even half of, if he can't do it, I surely cannot do it. So he's, of course, he's depressed, he's down. God says, come on. Come on, fight. So now he gets courage. And he does very similar things that Moses does. Moses sends spies to the land. He sends spies to the land. Moses, through God, parted the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan with God. Moses defeated two kings and shared land. Guess how many kings Joshua de defeated? 31 kings. Talk about an exponential increase. His leader... His boss, the person he's looking up to, only defeats two kings and doesn't quite make it into the promised land. God says, Moses, come up to the mountain. I will show you with your eyes the land that I'm giving you, but you will not enter it. This young buck, he's going to take over. And he's going to do what you couldn't do. Think about that. Imagine if Joshua didn't get in the fight. Imagine the greatness that was already his. God says, you, no one will be able to stand before you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Moses got, saw God face to face. God, he knew God face to face. Joshua didn't see that, but yet he accomplished more. It's not, it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder, whether you're a vicar, whether you're a bishop. It doesn't matter what title you have. It doesn't matter if you're at the bottom of the company or at the top level. If you would go with God, if you will fight the battle that he's given you, you would see things. You will see what eyes haven't seen. You will do what others haven't done. But get in the fight. Get in the fight. Joshua 12, there's, from verse 7, it gives us a list of all the kings that Joshua defeated. And right at the very end, verse 24, at the very end, it says, altogether, 31 kings in all. 
That's why you should fight. Because there are kingdoms with your name on it. There are promises with your name on it. He's paid for it already. And he's waiting for you and me to go and take it. By force, if we have to. Some things you go in there and you realize, oh, actually, the door is already open. I didn't even need to fight. But you had to go, though. Remember the four lepers? I thought we were in Kings somewhere. They were outcast because they had leprosy. And the enemy was around. And if all you know what, hey, we're hungry. We're going to die. Let's go to the enemy's camp. If we stay here, we're hungry, we die. If we go there, they kill us, we die. I'm like, yeah, sure, of course. If they kill you, you will die. You know, kill him dead, right? That type thing. You will die, whichever. But they took the step. They get to the enemy camp, and guess what? It's empty. There's just plunder there, and they're eating to their belly full, and they're like, wow, my God, look at all of this. Look at all of this. Oh, you know, this is wrong. The very people who were outcast, the very people who had a scar, and maybe that may be you, went back to the nation, the very people that chucked them out, the very people that said, you are unworthy to be amongst us, said, you know, we can't, just four of us, have all of this goodness. Why is God blessing you? Why do you need to get into the fight to get the plunder? Because the very people who inflicted the scars on you, you will need to go back to them and be like, come and see, man. Come, you know, no hard feelings. Come, come along. See what God has done for us. This is us. God did this. The, the lady at the well, prostitute, right? Or she's had many husbands, rather. John 4. No one wants to know her. She meets Jesus. This is the Savior. I can't keep this guy to myself. She runs back to the town, the very town who have ridiculed her, and say, come and see the one that we're waiting for. That's why you should embrace your scars. When never, the fight is never against people. It's against principalities and demons. You never fight against people. It's the demons that work inside of them. And that's what we're contending with. But fight, fight. The fight is your friend. The victory is yours. Just get in the fight. God has already done it. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We glorify your name. We exalt you, God. As we, as we wrap up, um, I, I want us to do something. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're very far away from God. You've, you've, you've grown away in your relationship with God. Or maybe you've never even given your life to him. You've never taken him seriously. The fight is your friend. There's a contention for that faith. He paid a big price for it. You know, he went to the till. He paid for it and told the person at the till, you decide whether I get what I paid for. And that's what Jesus did with us. He died for us and said, you decide whether you serve me or not, whether you follow me or not. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've gone so far from God. And he's saying, come on, enlist for service. There's greatness inside of you. I need you. You were born for a time as this. We're just going to say a quick prayer. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you to come out. But if that is you, at the end of the service, right through the double doors, the first room on your right, there will be our elders and pastors there waiting to pray for you, waiting to speak to you and encourage you and love on you. But God wants you back. You may have left him, but he never left you. The same promise he made to Joshua, he makes that same promise to us. He tells his disciples, I must go, because if I go, it's better and my Holy Spirit will come that will be with you always. So can we just say this prayer all together as one family? Lord, I give you my life. I surrender my will and, and my purpose, my entire being to you. I want to build my life on your foundation. Come into me today be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you've, this is the first time you've said that prayer, please, after the service, come into the room right on your left, and we'll be happy to pray with you. God bless you. God, give you, God we give you praise.